Hey Team McDill, it's Colonel Ben Johnson here, the 6th Air Refueling Wing Commander. And as a part of our Extremism Down Day, uh, we're having a special conversation, a special guest that I'm really excited for you to get to know and to hear her story. It is a remarkable story. She's a hero of mine and you're going to get to hear a little bit about that and we're going to have a conversation and try to understand what happened to her about 11 years ago that forever changed her lives. And what can we learn about it as an Air Force and as airmen in our stories today? So with that, Master Sergeant, First Sergeant DeAndre Parks, so pleased to get to have a conversation with you today. And uh, thanks for spending time with us. I love seeing that Air Mobility Command patch on your, on your left shoulder there. That's right. So you're one of us. You're up there at Andrews. But tell us a little bit about that fateful day uh, that I just mentioned, and for those who haven't seen you on your TED Talk or one of your you know, opportunities that you've spoken to different groups of Air Force leaders, share with us, please, um, what, what that did in your, or what happened to you and, and how that changed your life. Thank you so much for having me. And um, sometimes I ask myself, like, is this is this conversation? Does anyone still want to hear my story? You know, we wouldn't be having this conversation um, if we didn't need to. And so I am. <clears throat> I realized early on that um, not only my incident, but sharing my story was healing, right? And it's not just for me. And um, as you know, I know you know, sir. All of us, everyone has a story to share with them. And so for me. That night, April 20th of 2010, I was exactly where I was supposed to be. I was where the Air Force sent me to be, to become an Air Force medic. And so, and I say that because when I look back on it, there was nothing I could have changed about that night if I could have, mm -hmm. or nothing I want to. And so um, I was TDY to Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas. I uh, was two weeks into medic training. I had been a security forces, a defender for five years, and the Air Force gave me an opportunity to retrain to be an Air Force medic. And I became a little bit thrilled about that job when I was deployed to Balad, Iraq, when I used to uh, volunteer on my days off from defending the base. I'd go, I volunteer at the hospital, and um, I met a uh, medic there, and his job intrigued me, and I wanted to do what he did. And so, um, I was given that opportunity about five, five and a half years in. And so there I was two weeks into medic training and I was off base studying with two classmates. And it was, it was a pretty lively night for it to be the beginning of the week. It was nine o'clock at night. Um, I chose a seat uh, where I always do and still do to this day near the exit, you know, so I could easily get out in a way if something were to ever happen outside of my control. And I did just that. So we settled into those seats. Um, I immediately, I can't remember how much into our session, but it was a pretty intense session on airway. And I felt someone next to me and I knew I didn't know anyone in that yeah. town. Yeah, and, and you so, were there, and you were there yeah. studying with a couple of your classmates, Thanks. a couple of other staff sergeants, right? Yep, yeah. yeah. two other staff sergeants, uh, Tiny Jester and um, Jade Henderson, two of my classmates, and so, I feel someone next to me and I went to look up and he said, um, hey, it's Hitler's birthday. And as vigilant as I was, someone that fit that description, that looked like that description to him was me, myself, my classmate, another young lady. I'm in like the lounge area and the barista. Um, and so before I can give him a piece of my mind, whether it's from my background or the Air Force, respectfully and to represent both parts of who I make proud every day, um, he pulled up a 12 gauge shotgun and he shot towards my classmate, um, Jade. And then I got up to run and as I'm running and he's screaming white power, um, yelling, you know, we all know that there's two pellets or two, um, bucks inside of a shotgun. And so he's reload, he's reloaded as I'm running and I'm looking around. Uh, it's like, it almost as if I slapped myself in my own face. I felt myself get grazed on the left side of my face and I realized that I was making myself a target. And so, although we go through training as a, as a defender and basic military training, OTS, however you came through the military, you knew that I'm up, they see me, I'm down, right? That's, you knew how to not make yourself a target. And so I felt like I was back in training. That's why I say to this day, my military training, my security forces training, um, saved my life. And so I got down to play dead. Uh, 
he came over and he shot me as the, even though I was laying there completely still. And when he shot me, I didn't want to give him another reason to shoot me again. So I continued with that plan of trying to play dead. And, um, so you're, you're laying there yeah. and he shot you again. Or the first shot, it sounded like it grazed your face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you play dead, and then he shoots you again. And despite mm -hmm. that pain and like that having that di direct impact on you, you just stayed still somehow. That's incredible. I, I don't. It's not lost on me. And I say it by the grace of God, I, I stayed still, and that's why I'm so big on having a plan. I'm sorry. It's just where we are. Have a plan at Chipotle. Have a plan at Starbucks. What will you do if something were to out happen outside of your control? Now. I've never thought about that, but I was deployed to Iraq. I was stationed in a tower with a response time of five five minutes to me, right? What would I do if I was ever overrun, you know? And so I would come up with different scenarios outside of my training, within my training, what would I do? And ultimately, I said I would play dead if I couldn't defend myself. And so, but who knew I'd have to execute that in Texas? Yeah, here in America, yeah. 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 So you're doing, so you're playing dead despite the shock and searing pain, I'm sure. And then, then what happens? And so after um, that, he leaves the location and someone yells, he's gone. And I, I tell you, it's not like, what's one of the newer shows? 911. It's not like Rescue 911 when I was coming up, one of my favorite TV shows. Uh, help doesn't get there fast, right? But two weeks into medic training, I knew that medics, have to be safe. So the police officer arrived first um, to make sure the scene was safe. And um, I kind of said to myself, I, I, I guess this is how I'm going to die. You know, I'm going to bleed out right here on the floor. This is how I'm going to die. And so as help began to, to come <laughs> slowly, uh, I could hear on the radio, the police officers, they were still trying to find my attacker or our attacker. And so um, we were eventually transported to the local hospital, but unfortunately it was, it was a mass cow for that town. And so we were life flighted to Dallas Parkland, myself and um, Jade. What I did later find out was that um, our attacker had left that location, went to a um, bar where the young man who was checking IDs stopped him and saved, saved so many people there. And he took the brunt of the blast at close range and he died. Um, then he went, my attacker went to a residence and he committed suicide. Wow. And I think what I read about that, the young man that he killed, that he was also a veteran. Is that right? He was. Tim Donnelly is also a veteran. I, um, I took control of my recovery and my healing as soon as I could. Um, and sometimes I look back and I say, well, maybe it was too soon, but I was obsessed with becoming whole again. Yeah. instead of adjusting to my new normal. And so I say that to say um, his, my attacker's family reached out um, to try and communicate with me. I chose not to because I chose to forgive. Um, but in saying that, I've connected with Tim Dunnelly, our veteran who passed away with his family, and I'm in touch with his family. And so everything that I do, I make sure that I honor him. So here recently, the Air Force... Um, they enlisted Heritage Research Institute down at Maxwell Gunter, uh, recently put up a display. And I said, um, it's unfortunate. Do you ever think that in our, one of our enlisted museums that we would have a domestic terrorism hall yeah. right next to our Wounded Warrior um, Hall? Where we, have, it's an, where we have Aurora, um, Frank, it's just, yeah. So I said, I would love to go up there and tell my story, but I want Tim to be a part of it as well. Oh. And he's up there with us. Mm -hmm. So you said that, you know, you wanted to focus on being whole and your healing. Yes. And so, you know, I'm sure part of this, as you, as you just said, is forgiveness. Yes. You know, there's a lot of us that I think, you know, if you're a victim of a hate crime like this, uh, you know, your human natural response is you want to return that kind of, uh, vitriolic feeling, you know, yeah. you want to hate back uh, because you didn't do anything to deserve that and he tried to kill you. And uh, so how did you not hate back? Yes. So um, I learned, I remember looking in his eyes before he raised that gun and seeing that no one was there. 
Maybe it was the two week medic train I had so far because our train is amazing in the Air Force. Maybe I realized his pupils were dilated. Maybe I realized that, um, you know, maybe he was on some form of drugs, right? And so, but no, what I saw, what I felt was this, this guy needs help mm -hmm. in the midst of the hate that was being spewed and the hate that was, that was occurring, right? And so how did I not? Because it's so it's so easy to become the very thing that tried to tear you down, right? Wow. It's so easy to become a product of your environment negatively. It's so easy to do that, but why? You know, and so to become him, to become them or anyone like him, what how does that help? How does that help? And I'll be honest with you, sir, because thank you for asking that. I heard a lot of things that people thought would make me feel better about my incident and from all different backgrounds, to include people of color. Um, but hate, MLK said it best, Junior, hate is not going to drive out hate, right? Yeah. And so only love can do that. Yeah. And so that's, I live by that. And that's been instilled in me. My family is not that way. You know, they were angry. They didn't understand why that would happen to me. And after what I've served my country, I've been back. Why would that happen to you? But choosing to hate was made not choosing to hate was made easy by the relationships that I've had with everyone up until that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. That's interesting. Just how the relationships helped you through that. You know, I right. think something else that you said that was interesting and um, just to spend a moment on this because of, you know, the things that we we're seeing in the wake of the attack on the Capitol on uh, January 6th of this year. You know, you said, you know, it's so easy to just to hate, you know, it's so easy to just kind of you know, to go there and, um, you know, for, for whatever reasons that you feel like that that's the pull for somebody, right? And so whether it was your attacker or a response or other people, you know, uh, who you've encountered. So what, what do you think as an Air Force leader, as a senior NCO, like what, what's the message that we need to communicate to the airmen in our formations to help them not go there, you know, to, to resist that that pull toward, um, you know, the other, you know, hating the other. Right, right. And so transparency, having and creating the space like you are, but realizing who are you allowing to create the space to have these conversations. Um, I know that often we look for top down, um, but it really shifting a culture and changing a culture begin um, right there in PA's break room, hope you have one, or on the jet or out, for drinks or for dinner it, in our peer groups, creating a or shifting a culture begins there. Mm -hmm. And so waking up wanting to be a better person as well. So I remember last year when uh, the George Floyd incident happened and, and the rollout and the racial disparity report rollout, uh, creating the space to have that conversation. Okay, we did it. Okay, so how can we have these conversations without getting frustrated? And so I told them it's going to be a long road. So I came up with, I'm an acronym girl. So like road, right? So R, be respectful, um, mm -hmm. objectify. You want to speak objectively because as soon as you are, are subjective, then the person is not no longer, they can no longer hear you. You want them mm -hmm. to hear what you want to say and not be thrown off by your anger, your emotions, right? And so A, it says biases. We all have them. We all have them. And then D, only can we continue to develop a culture of diversity and inclusion by doing such. So it's going to be a long road, but remaining respectful, speaking objectively, and knowing that you have your own biases and bringing that to the table, only then can you continue to educate yourself, you know. And having these conversations on extremism, white supremacy is a part of extremism. You know, there's different levels to it. And so this wasn't just a talk about white supremacy in itself. It's if you feel as though... If you the conversations make you feel like a villain, or if you feel vilified by us just having this conversation, then there's a little bit there's some room for education and growth, right? Because mm. we're not coming to this conversation to vilify anyone. Right. We just want to know how can we be better. Right. Yeah. So creating the space, understanding that shifting a culture doesn't happen overnight, and changing character don't happen overnight, and having patience, having patience. That's Thanks. awesome. That's awesome. And yeah, we. We agree, you know, that we see this kind of extremism in different forms. Um, obviously, the, the form we saw uh, on January 6th at the Capitol was, I think, the same thing that you experienced 
um, you know, back in 2010 of, uh, in the form of white supremacy. So let me actually ask you about that because this is something that occur occurred to me as I listened to your TED talk and then her heard yeah. your talk again to the uh, Character and Leadership Symposium there at the Academy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here we are 11 years later and I just, it has, it makes me think, is it like discouraging to you at all to, to feel like, hey, you, you were a victim of, uh, you know, a white supremacist hate crime, you know, in 2010 and, uh, you know, here we are in January of 2021 and still seeing some of these same symbols have incredible power to motivate people to do some pretty extreme things like, uh, subvert our constitutional process and try to interrupt um, uh, voting on the results of the election. So how did how did that hit you and and how did you process that? Right. So you ever um, you ever go? I tried to tell you, or I tried. Where were yeah. you when I thought that? You know. So when this happened, it was as if like you know, don't talk about it. When I did the TED talk, they say don't say where it happened. It was very touchy. Um, and when this incident happened about five or six months prior, or so it was a Fort Hood shooting. Um, and so back then, right, I know media controls a lot, but a lot of mass shootings were occurring. And so I believe my mother said she may have seen it rolled across the bottom of CNN, but that's the most coverage I got, right? Wow, um, that's stunning. Yes, that's probably it. But other than that, it was, it was suppressed. It wasn't shared. And so we probably wouldn't be here today if I didn't share our story. I told you there were three of us that were active duty. One, it was a civilian that, um, and two civilians um, that walked away that night. And so I know that if I didn't share my story, we wouldn't be here today, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't be a living, breathing, um, pretty much example of what it's like. To Inspiration, survive. I'd say. Yes. <laughs> you are an inspiration and just to how you're able to turn the other cheek in, in the sense of not hating back and, and really right. forgive and, and heal. Yeah. What else has been a part of your healing process? Oh my goodness. So I coined it um, healing through awareness. Uh, it's not, it hasn't been easy. It may come off as though it is, but it hasn't been easy. And so, um, Every time I share my story, I'm, I'm given a platform. I'm able um, to help others, inspire others. Um, that's most definitely helping in my recovery. Um, continuing to seek the help that I need with mental health services. Uh, knowing when it's okay to not be okay. Knowing that I don't have to be so strong, even though I am, right? Um, being open, honest, and transparent with those who were chosen to supervise me. Um, I was asked like, how do you secure your mentors or who's your mentor? And I tell you now, no one is off the hook for being a mentor. If you've been considered a leader, if you have ranked on your sleeve, you are my mentor. And so um, I make it known as such, right? That, hey, this is what I'm going through. This is how I'm feeling. This is how, this is how I might feel in this month when the time changes because I'm remembering that this incident occurred. But being open, honest, and transparent with those leaders in my supervision or in my chain has made recovery easy. They know when I need to check out. But that's something that I learned that I had to do because very early on in my recovery, I thought you all were mind readers. Sitting here as a first sergeant, no, we're not. As a commander, we're not my readers, right? And so just make sure you create the space for someone to be able to approach you. And so I've been very blessed to have great leaders. Um, and I, I talked about that with NCLS because, because of those leaders, I'm still sitting here today in this uniform. Yeah. And because of those leaders, I am okay and I find empowerment. And if I had to transition, Right. And so it's, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned some of those commanders that yes. have been involved in, in your recovery and how they believed in you and created opportunities for you and space for you to tell your story. And as you said, you know, that, that helped bring about that healing. Well, I have to say, you know, it is just remarkable to me that you could be shot twice, once at, well, I guess both at point blank range, uh, one a direct hit and and then go into recovery and here, you know, be a first sergeant, be a senior NCO, still on active duty, still rocking and rolling as a leader. Uh, it's just really remarkable. Uh, could you just, because we 
I've kind of fast forwarded us. Could you just tell people a little bit like how how hard was that recovery? I mean, I you know a lot of people just wouldn't have made it. They would be on, they'd be medically retired right now, right? And right. you know right. that's that's a path, and certainly there is there is no shame in that at all. And we have a lot of one amazing veterans who who you know went through terrible things and who are medically retired. But how did right. you stay in the fight? Right, uh, it surprised me to this day. It's like I have to pinch myself. But one thing I realized about myself, uh, which is a gift and a curse, I always move forward. Yeah. And I'm always looking forward. And so when I woke up and I saw, I said, okay, my leg is still here. I'm going to have to walk soon, right? And so PT, they came in and got me and made me walk. I said, okay, okay, this comes out in three months and then I'll be able to walk on my own. I just kept moving forward and forward. And the times that I did fall back, I had the hair, the help there for me and mental health, right? And so, and that happened often, but I had my commander, my security forces commander that kept me a valuable part of the team, whether it was answering his phones or just keeping the first sergeant um, company, him company, his wife company. Uh, we created um, PT, swim PT. Oh, it was so hilarious. She taught so many defenders how to swim. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but we did swim PT at Tinker Air Force Base. And so, but I, I found myself, I just kept moving forward and then educated myself on the process. And so that's why I was able to retrain within a year because I was still getting the help that I needed, right, uh, to be whole or to accept my new normal. But what I realized is that um, after being able to retrain to be a medic and leave a security forces career field, um, I realized that the medical evaluation board was the best decision of my career, of my health journey, right? And so going through a medical evaluation board, I realized that we are put in this uniform, we're the 1%, right, to protect and serve and to defend this country. And the very moment that I'm not able to do that, I'll need to transition, right? Like so many of our brothers and sisters have. So knowing and understanding that it's not just sexy to say that we're the weapon system. We really are the weapon yeah. system. And so the most valuable weapon system and understanding that helped me to stay physically fit the best way I knew how to stay in the fight the best way I knew how. And so to me bees or Rilo later, um, a deployment to Kuwait, wow. <laughs> I, as a first sergeant, I'm still here. Yes. That's amazing. That's yes. amazing. Well, it's, I mean, it is a tribute, you know, to, to your perseverance uh, and to the leaders that really supported you through that. Tell, tell our uh, audience, you know, one of the things that wasn't clear to me in, in the, as I did, you know, as I looked at and uh, watched some of your other uh, speaking opportunities is mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the airmen that were studying there with you. Mm -hmm. um, what, have you kept in touch with them? I know they survived. Did they, you know, is this one of these events like you, you're now kind of connected forever or have you guys, uh, do you have any kind of remaining connection with them and how did they do? Yes. That's one thing I love about the Air Force is my, um, my family. And so I try to explain that uh, to people is that who was there to help me bathe to get on the commode um, was an airman, right? My family couldn't be there for me. Who was there to drive my my new Audi when I couldn't, an airman, right? To help me get to my appointment. <laughs> so it was my Air Force family. And so Jade Henderson, who um, she was shot, she was grazed in the back of her head and then she had her hand blown out from blocking the blast. Um, we had gone through technical training during the same time and we were stationed together at um, Aviano in Italy. So we knew each other and um, she and um, Tanya Jesser, they had became connected during the TDY. We were only there for two weeks. Wow. It's amazing how much time that you get to make each other family. And so they had each other um, to lean on. Jade Henderson has been medically retired as of um, as 16 years. Okay. And um, I believe Jess Jessica is still, um, is still serving. It's not lost on me that we took different routes of recovery, yeah. right? You had me like, okay, rabbit, I can rub a rabbit in therapy. That's helpful. Retail therapy psychiatrist, <laughs> Medicaid, I'm, I'm going to do everything yeah. that I possibly can, right? Because I set out to serve and protect my country, you know, and so, and that's what I'm going to do. And so we're still out here kicking butt, getting after Thanks it, are. for sure. That's awesome. Well, DeAndre, this has been, this has been so inspiring. And I loved uh, your message for us in terms of thinking about, hey, how do we, 
how do we prevent ourselves and, and uh, keep our, our up-and-coming airmen uh, on the right path and, and avoid this corrosive effect of extremism? And I just took the note. I loved your acronym of ROAD. Make sure I got this right, though, please. Uh, you know, that, that respectful openness to, to the other, to each other, to really spend time together, um, to think objectively, you know, and, and as we do that. Uh, acknowledge biases that we have. I think this is huge. You know, obviously we're we're all humans. We're products of our of our social environments, and we need to acknowledge those biases. And then develop, uh, and and be edu you know, and look for the opportunities to learn and grow. Yeah. So yes. that's so helpful. I think it's going to be so helpful for Team McDill. Thank you so much for spending Absolutely. this time with us on Lead Conversations. Right back at you. So first, our, our Master Sergeant Parks this has been awesome. I look forward to hopefully continuing this connection and uh, just wish you every success in the world. And I know that although you won't be the first female Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, there are some barriers you can still break. And I know that's a dream in your heart, and I, I support you. She beat me to it, but I, I'm glad she beat me to it. <laughs> but there's, there's still some firsts you can accomplish there. Oh, yes. So yes. <laughs> I wish you every success in the world. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thank you.